So, so why depression? You know, a mind of your own is, is focused, I mean, primarily on depression, yes. although there are a lot of little offshoots that make you realize that, you know, everything might be linked to the same, to the same cause, but why yeah. depression specifically? Right. So, so what you're saying is very true because the illusion of these different diseases being different diseases um, is one that I'd like to myth bust, you know, up front, you know, is depression really different from any other physical illness in that it's just a message that there is a source of imbalance to be examined, right? Um, but depression, I think I wanted to reach the most people I possibly could with my credentials, quote unquote. Uh, and the truth is that, you know, 11% of Americans are taking psychotropic drugs, one in four women of reproductive age are. Depression is the leading cause in the world of disability, according to the World Health Organization. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't pick a heavier hitter. Um, and it also happens to be one that, that touches the very core of major questions we have to begin asking about our orientation towards our bodies and our um, real lack of acknowledgement that there's anything beyond the body in all of conventional medicine. You know, that there is such a thing as, um, you know, a soul or spirit is something that, you know, despite the fact that psychiatrist actually means doctor of the soul, it couldn't, it couldn't be more um, divorced in a really Cartesian way, you know, from, from any acknowledgement that there is any role for experience, right? Everything is management and uh, functionality and, you know, punching the clock and staying um, productive. So it, it happens to be a subject that really lends itself to, to looking at these bigger issues, which I think do uh, manifest in other physical illness as well. One, one of the spookiest things that I've ever, I've ever encountered was two, two very close friends of mine, you might even call them fam, very close family members, um, got divorced. And mm -hmm. when they got divorced, they were, you know, the first thing that their, that their psychologists did was they refer them to a psychiatrist to prescribe them some kind of an antidepressant. It's a perfect example. And, and there wasn't, and these are very smart people and they both did it. They both took it. And because, you know, I think that there is sort of this, we just do what our doctors tell us to do. I mean, you're, you're, it's just the way that we, we were raised. If the doctor tells you to do something, then you give it a shot. You know, unless, unless you, you know, you experience, like you said, like a transformative illness of your own where you have to find other ways. So you don't really ever come to that conclusion and you just do what your doctor tells you to do. These people both took antidepressants and started fading away. Like, you know, they were, yeah, they weren't, they weren't like, they weren't like crying or like, you know, and, you know, curling up in a fetal position, but they were also not themselves. They were gone. They were basically just gone for a couple months until I started my, and my, my sister started, you know, both being like, Hey, um, what the hell is going on? Like, are you, yeah, kidding? you don't know, you're, you're really doing this to yourself right now. So, I mean, the fact that this is not, um, this wasn't a chronic condition. This, this, this wasn't even a chronic condition. This wasn't even, this wasn't nothing. This was just a life circumstance that they were prescribed medicine for. Yes, it's amazing. You know, I love that example because it really illustrates what we're dealing with here. You know, there, there's recent data just now that echoes previous data that suggests basically most prescriptions for antidepressants are written by non-specialists and so mostly family practice doctors and GPs, internists, and that more than half of prescriptions are written not for depression for like dog dying, for divorce, for circumstantial experiences. And listen, doctors, for the most part, I have to believe are not bad people. You know, this is the tools that we were given to ease struggle and suffering. We want to fix it, right? That's part of the problem is the whole mentality of conventional medicine is fix it, fix it, fix it. And so, you know, a divorce is challenging. You know, if, for many people, it's like a birth canal, you know, to, to a new you, to your next chapter. And if, if everything is co-conspiring around you to, to essentially say like, don't go there, that could hurt. Or don't go there, like that could actually interfere with work or don't go there, you have shit to do, you know, you don't have time for that. Then when somebody offers you a hand in the form of a prescription, you know, how could you not take it? Why would you not take it? And part of my mission, um, you know, it has really been to, to focus on some of the almost sensational sounding uh, concerns that I've developed after a deep dive into the literature, which include the fact that taking an antidepressant prescription um, can actually change the course of your life and the lives of other people within days of your first dose. You know, I got an email the other day uh, from a woman who wants to, you know, make her, her presence known to me. And she said, my husband um, 
never suffered from depression in his entire life, was not a psychiatric patient. He was struggling with insomnia, circumstantial insomnia, and his internist prescribed him an SSRI antidepressant, and five weeks later, he was found dead hanging in his garage. So she's pretty upset about this, right? And to her, it's pretty clear the causative relationship between that medication and her husband's death. And guess what? People shoot up schools, they take down airplanes, they kill their babies and their children, they murder their spouses, they behave in heinous ways that human beings, like to a person, would never ever consider engaging, if not for being under the influence of, uh, you know, such an altering chemical that we have barely characterized what it does. So if it were the magic pill, we are told it is, and, you know, and I was in my training, you know, that's safe and effective and a quick fix. Like, of course, why would you not take it? But the problem is we are, we are representing it in a way that is wholly inconsistent with what, you know, the medical literature is telling us are its attendant risks. And then we're not even grappling with the bigger picture question of, is there a role for sitting in your experience? Is there a role for witnessing your experience? Is there actually a purpose and a meaning personal to you for the types of, you know, suffering that you're exposed to? You know, that we, you know, we can't even have that conversation, right? Other than places like this. So it's, it's a complex issue and I appreciate your, you know, highlighting that element of it. 